everyone once more for this third lecture of the five on Rembrandt. And uh, please uh, silence your cell phones again, just a reminder. Um, since yesterday we tried to switch from the PowerPoint to the internet and it took a little while. I think it's better if we begin from Google Arts and Culture today just to show you a couple of things. And in fact, what I wanted to show you specifically uh, was the night watch. Because of course, I got carried away talking to you about history painting and I didn't get to the most important of the history paintings, so to speak, the night watch. So even though today's lecture is about Rembrandt's women, and this will be the focus. I would like to begin by going to the Night Watch, the painting from 1642, that really marks the high point of Rembrandt's career in Amsterdam. Of course, it's the most famous painting in the Rijksmuseum and the most iconic of all of the Dutch paintings from the Golden Age. And we all seem to know all kinds of things about this painting. But actually, at the end of the day, it's full of mysteries and unsolved questions. We do know what it represents. We do know when it was painted and who commissioned it. But insofar as specific meanings and why it is painted the way it is, art historians to this day cannot come to an agreement. So without spending a lot of time talking and not looking. Let's take a look at this picture, the night watch. And what you can see here, if you go to Google Arts and Culture, again, is that, if you can read this, it is a huge painting, 437 centimeters by 360 centimeters, and that the painting shows the company of Captain Franz Banning Koch and the Lieutenant Willem van Reitenberg, bekend as the Nachtwacht, yeah? the night watch. But what does night watch actually mean? What are these people doing? This is a militia company. This is one of the many militia companies that existed in Holland in 17th century. The militia companies were essentially like civic associations of men who got together periodically. They had their militia company halls. They would have arms. And this particular company, they were almost like, sorry, like military reserve. And this particular company of Franz Banning Koch were also known as musketeers. They were the only ones in Amsterdam who had guns, were allowed to carry guns which is why guns are prominently featured in the night watch. Militia companies were not really active duty officers or people who went out to fight. Nobody dressed like this is going out to fight, but they were commemorative companies of the great struggle of the Dutch against the lights down. Let's go and have the lights down. I will figure out. Yes, OK. They were commemorating the great struggle of the Dutch against the Spanish Habsburgs of the late 16th century and the Dutch independence, the hard-won Dutch independence in the beginning of the 17th century. So Harlem, Amsterdam, The Hague, Leiden, they all had militia companies. And periodically, they would go promenade through the city to commemorate some famous battles from the past. But they really were not fighting men. And it was like a men's club, but also this whole notion of civic duty in Holland. So we have the captain and his lieutenant and 18 other officers that are identified. And apparently, when Rembrandt got the commission, we don't have paperwork. But we know enough to know that apparently people paid as much as they wanted to, depending on how he painted them. Those who were painted in the front and more prominently paid more to him per head than those who were in the back. So if you didn't want to pay that much, he said, put me in the back. 
So this is a gr group portrait of a militia company. But at the same time, it is a history painting. It's one of these strange hybrids because you know, typically militia company portraits would just line up people like an old-fashioned studio photograph, and they would all be very regularly positioned across the composition, and then you could identify every single one like in an old-fashioned group portrait. But Rembrandt cannot stay still and cannot stick to rules of a genre. So he immediately changed it and turned it into something akin to a film still something akin to a moving picture, to an event. And this is where art historians disagree. They do not know what event this commemorates. Some of them have argued that it commemorates a particularly important event in the life of this militia company when the exiled queen of France, Marie de Medici, who was exiled by her own son, visited Amsterdam, and this particular militia company went out to greet her. Other people just say, oh, well, Rembrandt captures just one particular promenade of many that happened as these people sort of celebrated the establishment of the companies. The answer is we do not know. What makes this unconventional? Many, many things. First and foremost, I said it's not a portrait. It's not a group portrait. It's an event. It's like a movie still. Secondly, uh, what, it, what you see here, and I know the lights are still not dim enough to really appreciate this painting, but we will zoom in. You see this dramatic light and shadow, of course, that chiaroscuro, which makes it difficult to read the picture. That makes it also very unconventional as a group portrait, because who wants to be so lost in shadows? You pay for your portrait, and then they cannot see you. I mean, half of these 18 people who have been identified are invisible, de facto. Thirdly, as you look at this composition, you realize that everybody is doing his, or his business. Somebody is cleaning a gun. Somebody is uh, drumming over there in the corner. Somebody is pulling a sword. I'm going to zoom in so you can see some of these things. You see, there is the drummer of the company in this corner. There are some officers you can see here in the back. Here is some person with a gun behind the lieutenant. Franz Banning Koch is explaining something to the lieutenant. Lieutenant is walking towards us with this spear, which reminds you of that same spear that the Oriental man was holding in the raising of the cross. Again, Rembrandt using the same props, so to speak. And these beautiful, beautiful details of the attire tell you that, yes, these guys paid him well, and they wanted to be portrayed very beautifully, very competently, the way a proper painter should paint. And Rembrandt obliges. Rembrandt obliges. But he also eccentrically goes from super finished areas, such as these ones, right, with the lace with this notion that you can actually feel the texture of the fabric. You can see this extended hand of the captain to this rather slapdash handling of some of the faces. Look at these people in the back. Look at this. Is this a painting? This is like Domier's caricatures from 19th century France. So Rembrandt basically can alternate between very well-finished areas in a painting and something barely painted or slapdash, as if to provoke, again, the audience to accept him as he thinks, as he thinks about the art of painting. And he seems to be telling you, my painting is finished when I think it is finished. And he's also thinking like a uh, almost like Leonardo, if you remember from last year, very optically. In other words, when people show up in a crowd, you have those that are closer to you, where you have very clear perspective, and then you have all these dim lights, and you have faces that look ghostly. So why paint them otherwise if this is what optics tells you? So this kind of optical intelligence 
or optical sensibility is also what separates Rembrandt from many of his peers. This helmet that you see here with the oak leaves is an emblematic element. The oak leaves apparently were among the insignia of this militia company. So that's why the helmet appears right next to Franz Banning Koch. So it's an emblem. But even more eccentric than that emblem is the appearance of this golden girl. What is this little girl dressed in this golden dress doing in the middle of the militia company? Nobody knows. Our best guess today as art historians is that she is, and I'm not super happy with it, a mascot. That she is a symbolic figure, she is nobody, she is the mascot of the company or another visual emblem or ribas, if you will. Because not only is she wearing this golden dress that makes her sort of sparkle there in the middle of this dark scene, but also she has a chicken hanging from her waist. A whole chicken. Okay? Look at the chicken. You can only see this on Google Art. Look at that. It's like, what's going on with this man? What's going on with this whole commission? Well, apparently, and you, um, because of the connection between South Africa and the Dutch, you can understand the coal veneers, they were a claw, or coal veneers, that was another name for this militia company. So people have argued that the chicken and the claws of the chicken should remind us of the name of the company as well. Yeah, but it is still a very preposterous image as a symbol. Hanging chicken from a golden dress on this nice, delicate girl who seems to be running away from something in the middle of this darkness. So there are all kinds of puzzles in this very, very famous picture, but that's my favorite one. But let's take a look at her face just for a moment. Look at that face. And if you've ever seen a portrait of Rembrandt's first wife, Saskia van Eilenburg. I think this little girl in the golden dress looks like her. Since we're talking today about Rembrandt's women, remember this face. He made her look like a child in this picture. She's shorter than she should be as an adult woman vis-a-vis -vis everybody else in this company. But that face is very close to the face of Saskia. And that's my feeling. I have always believed that this is somehow a strange little introduction of Saskia in the militia company, dressed up like some kind of old-fashioned biblical queen. <laughs> she doesn't look Dutch at all with her attire, with that pearl earring, with the dress. So she looks, look, look how tiny she is vis-a-vis -vis everyone else. But even more fun to me and even more convincing uh, that in, in terms of her identity as Saskia is the fact that if you look above her, okay, she's placed very strategically where you have an opening in the composition between this officer and the captain, right? So you can immediately spot her. She is spotlit actually. But then as you go up above her, you see that helmet with the oak leaves, which is emblem of the company. And then you go right above the helmet. And guess who is there? <laughs> it's like, do you have a doubt? Does anyone have a doubt here about Rembrandt's eye and the little cap? So the fact that he placed himself above that helmet with the oak leaf, which can also signify laurel and fame and all of those other connotations. And then you see this little eye with a little dark cap, which is the painter's cap. And then below you see this girl who looks like Saskia makes me think that even when he was given the most official commission, this super big painting for a very important place, 
he couldn't help but introduce this element of personal narrative. He simply could not. Rembrandt has to bring himself into every work. And, but this is the, the most comical one, the eye in the night watch. And by the way, art historians have even said, no, this is over-interpretation. It cannot be Rembrandt. Well, what else could it be? The eye with the soft cap. Anyway, so this is just a little bit of introduction about Rembrandt's women, in a sense, because now we will be looking at portraits of Saskia. But I wanted to tell you that when people talk about the Night Watch and they say, oh, yes, this is the high point of Rembrandt's career, and then afterwards, People didn't like it, he wasn't uh, properly paid for it. Those were all kinds of anecdotes circulating in the past that apparently it was so unconventional that it was also the beginning of his destruction as an artist. That is an overstatement because he continued to work very successfully through the 40s and painted a lot of other images. He was still very much in demand, so his decline in terms of popularity begins from around 1650. So the Night Watch was well received from all we know, even though we do not have a lot of written records, unfortunately. So let's now go back to the PowerPoint and look at our images for today for Rembrandt's women. And we can start from the beginning. And we can probably just go like this. I'm not going to bother with the presenter view. So you see, he does not idealize. We already said that. This is one of those women. I already introduced the subject of Rembrandt's women, in a sense, yesterday when I talked about Andromeda and Susanna and the elders, and the woman naked sitting on the rock who looks like Diana or one of the nymphs, but is so unlike all of those divinities or semi-divinities, so unidealized. But this is one of the more idealized of those portraits of women. Maybe we can lower the lights a little bit more. Or this is it. OK. So I think this will do. This is one of the more idealized portraits that he made of Saskia when they were getting married, when he was engaged to her. And he made this portrait. And you can see here that he wrote on the portrait that it was drawn after my wife, meaning after her likeness, when she was 21 years old, the third day after we were engaged in June. 1633. Such a wonderful personal image. This was certainly not intended to be sold. It stayed in his collection. So even though Rembrandt created lots of works for the market, and he was very savvy initially as a businessman and promoted himself well and made quite a bit of money and got a very nice big house in Amsterdam, he also created lots of works <coughs> for himself, for himself. And this portrait of Saskia is one of those. And if you look at it, this portrait, it doesn't give you the uh, indication of what the medium is, but this is actually metal point. We are talking about lights? Yes. Well, the lights, apparently, this is the maximum if we don't want complete darkness. I see. OK, we can try. So we can try. We will try. So what we have here is I will continue talking, and then we will be waiting for the lights to dim. But what you see here is Saskia, who doesn't look like a proper Dutch lady, correct? She's wearing a wide-brimmed hat with flowers, and that hat would automatically identify her as a shepherdess type. Pastoral place where the lovers were described always as the shepherd and the shepherdess were extremely popular throughout Europe at this moment. Those pastoral plays were typically written in Italy. Guarino Guarini was somebody who was very popular, Il Pastor Fido. His particular pastoral play was my God, recast in so many different places on the continent and in England. So in this pastoral place, the lovers would be the shepherd and the shepherdess. And why is it important that they are shepherd and shepherdess? Because it's all about going back to nature, the purity of love, outside the city, etc. So 
he gave her one of those white brimmed hats with flowers. She's also holding a little flower in her hand, and she has this kind of thinking look, almost melancholy look. This is a young woman in 1633-21. This poor young woman will not live a very long life. She will die in 1642 at age 30. And if you remember that the night watch was painted in 1642, then the suggestion that that little girl in gold who is running away, maybe Saskia, becomes even more intriguing. Almost like his own personal sort of meditation of sorts, but we would never be able to prove this. I could never write this, of course. But Saskia died in 1642, and Night Watch was painted in 1642. And the golden girl is there. So there she is looking rather pretty, unusually pretty, <coughs> uncommonly pretty. And he seems to have been very fond of her. He actually came to Amsterdam to work in the studio or the business of her uncle, Van Eilenburg. He was like an art agent, artist, somebody who dealt in marketing of art, and he worked and painted for him in the studio, and that's how he met her. But she was an orphaned child, and she had a bit of money, and neither her uncle nor the other relatives were very happy when she decided to marry Rembrandt. In fact, they asked for very strict prenuptial agreement, stating that if Saskia were to die before Rembrandt, all of the money that she had inherited from her parents and brought into the marriage would have to be returned if he ever remarried. So she was apparently not a very strong constitution physically and health, and you can only imagine 17th century medical care and what may have been wrong with her. But when they got married, that was written as an agreement that if she dies and he ever remarries, all of the money she brought to the marriage would have to go back to the uncles. So as soon as they got married, he began, thank you so much, he began painting more and more images. This is nice. And you can see here a close-up of this lovely little silver point or metal point drawing. Those are drawings that are not done with pencil or charcoal, but you take, this is on parchment. And it is parchment covered with layers of gesso. And then you kind of scratch into it ever so slightly. And there is a bit of emulsion. And that emulsion <laughs> leads to oxidation. I'm not quite sure about the technique. But the lines become visible and darker as you draw with the metal point into this gessoed parchment. And uh, as a result of that, you can create very, very fine lines that look like lines that you can typically accomplish with an etcher's needle or engraver's needle. So it's not a multiple, it's a unique work of art, but emulating a style of etching because of those fine lines. At the same time, even though she's prettified, beautified, you can also see Rembrandt's typical approach to this idea that you, know, you can just have a couple of lines here describing a sleeve Look at these scratched lines. Here it's very fine, nice shadowing, and at the same time you have this extremely sketchy approach elsewhere. We'll talk more about Rembrandt on paper tomorrow, but this is just to give you, to make you more attuned to his eccentricities in terms of handling of the medium as a draftsman and also as an etcher. So he begins to paint her, and he paints her again and again. And in some images, she appears very regal looking, such as here, for instance. This is in the Rijks Museum. Many of these portraits are not dated. Most of Rembrandt pictures are not dated. Why do you think that Rembrandt research project spent all those years trying to establish what was Rembrandt, what was not? 30 years they've been working on that catalog raisonne. He would put his signature, but not necessarily the date. You see, he makes her look regal and non-Dutch. Dutch women didn't wear this kind of attire in 17th century. They would wear the white collars and the dark dresses. So she looks relatively exoticized 
those big pearl earrings, that veil behind her head, all of that makes her look special, unusual, uncommon. Look at that golden embroidery here that you find. At the same time, while he idealizes her dress and ennobles her, he does not beautify her face, per se. He keeps that kind of round, soft, white skin, but not necessarily smoothing her out or correcting any perceived imperfections. Even the woman he loves so much, he does not idealize. This is a case in point. On the one hand, you have that nice white brimmed red hat with that big feather golden chain there on the hat. This is all very, very fancy clothing that is, again, not your typical Dutch attire. His formal portraits of Dutch men and Dutch women would show them in what you consider upper class dress with the white collars and black dress. But here you have something fanciful, something Italianite, something exotic that she's wearing. We don't know what, but look at that face. Look at that smile. Look at that little tooth they're showing. There is this incredible blending of naturalism and idealization, and once more a dissonance, almost like a purposeful dissonance, so that your mind goes back and forth. Is this an ideal image? Is this a real woman? Who is this woman that we are looking at? This is a proper portrait. Opian copied, sorry for the cropping of the name, but this is a detail of one of the fanciest portraits that Rembrandt painted around the same time in the 1630s, 1634. This portrait, by the way, and its counterpart, a male portrait, were recently sold at Christie's for a huge amount of money, I believe somewhere around 100 million euros. But neither the Rijksmuseum, one of them had been in France, one of them had been in Holland, the double portraits of the husband and wife, Martin Solmans and uh, Opien Kopit. And the Rijksmuseum and Louvre bought them jointly so they would not go to private hands. So they will be shown half a year or maybe half the time on extended loan to the Louvre and half the time at the Rijksmuseum. It's that difficult for museums these days to acquire major pieces. But you can see, you can see instantly that this woman is painted very differently than Saskia. Smoothly handled when it comes to the skin, every single detail exquisitely rendered because he is paid quite a bit of money. This is the time when he paints Abraham and Isaac, when he paints Samson. 1630s when he tries to be like Rubens in terms of history painting, but also he wants to be the greatest portrait painter in Holland. And he wants to follow the rules of portraiture because this is where the money is. Remember the little ring hanging here because in addition to all of the pearls that she's wearing, there is like a golden chain and a little ring, the marriage ring, because you will see that, you will see that again in some of the portraits today. Here is the double portrait with her husband. So if you ever thought that Rembrandt couldn't do fine painting, here is a perfect example of how accomplished he actually was. If he had wanted, he could have done this for the rest of his life. And he could have been very comfortable. These are life-size, the only full-figure portraits that he painted, life-size, very impressive. These two people must have been very, very wealthy, and they wanted something which was very uncommon in Holland, full-size figure. Because you know, full-size figure in Europe in 17th century is only for kings, very, very high nobles, and popes. Ordinary people, no matter how wealthy, do not get painted like this. But you can see this is a major dandy here <laughs> from his attire. I mean, these are proper Dutch, but even they are excessively embellished. But you can certainly see that they differ 
from Saskia's dress I just showed you. So these are the two portraits that the two museums own jointly now. Here is just another detail to show you that Rembrandt could do anything he wanted, if he wanted, and when he wanted. A lovely detail of her face, absolutely. Look at the fine rendering of the skin, of the reflection in the eyes, of the lace, of the reflections in each pearl that she wears. When he was asked to create beautiful pictures with fine detail, he certainly could do it. Just like in the garb that was worn by the captain in the night watch. So whatever possessed our Rembrandt to paint in such a slapdash manner later on, it wasn't his failing eyesight. It was a conscious choice to kind of go between very finished and highly unfinished work and to essentially claim that he has, you know, poetic license, painterly license to do that. Now, compare this lady, Opian Copit, to this portrait of Saskia as Flora. Saskia as Flora. Flora is a Roman goddess, goddess of spring, goddess of fertility, goddess of the courtesans in Rome. When you portray the young woman as Flora in 17th century, you typically suggested all of these notions, sexuality, but also fertility, procreation, the idea that she will give birth to children, promise of many children. Flora would be typically dressed in green and she would have flowers in her hair, but you look at her and you kind of feel that this is like just a dress up game. There is no goddess here whatsoever. He gives her that green, that exotic dress with that nice satin sleeves and even this upper part of the skirt. And she raises that skirt, that upper part of the dress, as if to suggest a roundness of the belly. And Saskia did give birth between 1633 and 1642 to several children, a couple of whom died in infancy. But when she died, Rembrandt was left with a couple of small kids at home and needed to hire a nanny, of course. So there is Saskia once more half idealized, but so real, human, vulnerable, and ordinary in her face. Just ordinary looking, like a person you could encounter in the street. She has the staff, Flora's staff, like a queen queen of spring with her staff, and she looks at us, but there is absolutely no intimation of that kind of sensuality one associates with flora, invitation to the beholder. She looks very chaste, very much like a young woman who is somewhat uncomfortable in this dress. Now, here is Saskia in an Arcadian costume, a different rendering, 1635, very close to Flora. Once more greenish dress. By the way, green can be very fugitive pigment, and green can disappear over time depending on how they were mixing particular greens, and it can turn to blue or blue-gray. So her dress would have been brighter initially in 17th century. And this is a more typical flora gesture when she looks towards the beholder and produces lots of flowers, almost like flowers coming from her figure, from her form, from the belly. And those are the flowers that she gives to the world through children. And once more, you have that stuff that makes it look like a scepter of a queen big pearl earrings and this sort of sprig of greenery on her hair that suggests fertility and growth. This is the most provocative, shall we say, that he will ever turn Saskia into when it comes to sensuality. This is the most eroticized image of Saskia that you can imagine. For the most part, she remains this very chaste, very bashful young woman in his portraits. With couple of exceptions such as this. Well, and an exception such as this. 
So you saw what he can do with Opie and Copit and her husband, those gorgeous portraits. Exactly in the same year, 1635, he paints this double portrait of himself and Saskia, which is very comical. There is no other way to describe this. Again, why did he do this? He paints himself, look at him, grinning with open mouth, which is considered indecorous, inappropriate, and certainly not handsome. You know, showing teeth in painting was just for the brutes, for the peasants. Proper people would never, never, ever do that. Completely different from our culture. So there he is, and there she is looking rather uncomfortable sitting on his lap. And he's holding a glass of wine, and there is a peacock behind them. And the peacock that you see is actually part of what they would call in Holland a peacock pie. I apologize if you already know this, but one of the great delicacies served at very wealthy banquets was a peacock pie, where the peacock meat would have been put into a pie, but then covered with the actual bird, which had been prepared beforehand after they killed it. So half of the bird would be cleaned and would be used as a lid for the peacock pie. And when you see a still life with a peacock pie, you should immediately know that it signifies um, excess of luxury. Killing a peacock and making a peacock pie was the high point of luxury and something that the Dutch, the good old Calvinist Dutch did not condone too much. Or you were not supposed to show it off. So Rembrandt purposefully puts that peacock pie and the glass of wine which is also in moderation, raising the glass of wine and enjoying life, carpe diem. And the joke is that maybe he painted this for his home, and maybe he wanted to irritate the uncles of Saskia when they came for a visit. <laughs> like, I got all this money by burying your niece. <laughs> so now I'm going to be like the prodigal son in the inn, drinking it all and eating peacock pies. <laughs> Maybe. It's a joke, but it's a funny joke. But the other, the other possibility is that Rembrandt is showing himself the way many artists of the time period showed themselves, which is as the prodigal son. Because prodigal son signifies talent, gift, lots of gifts that you have, gifts that you squander. And by the way, being an artist in 17th century was very similar to being an artist today. You're a very talented young person, but you will waste your life away by choosing art as a profession. Nobody thought that it was a good profession per se, even then. So many artists in Holland actually showed themselves as the so-called prodigal son in the inn. And actually, Sometimes, many times, many times the wife would be featured as the girl that he wastes his time with in the inn. So this is not super unusual. When we get to Vermeer, those of you who sign up for the lecture on Saturday, you will see a couple of others of these prodigal sons. So it could be one or the other or both what he's trying to convey. He also wears a sword, by the way, and I'm always thinking when I look at this picture that the sword, you know, only noble people could wear swords in most of Europe. As a matter of fact, Caravaggio got into trouble with the law in Rome, among other things, for wearing a sword, walking around with a sword, and he was not entitled to that. And this is this young Rembrandt who certainly didn't have a sword and walked around Amsterdam with it but he just puts that sword to historiate himself, to make himself like the prodigal son, full of money and squandering it all. But you remember the pen is mightier than the sword? The artist's sword is his brush. So I have a feeling that symbolically, this very prominent sword in the foreground is like, here I am wielding my sword, the sword of my painting, and I'm gonna be noble because of my painting. And actually, it feeds into the idea of prodigal son if the prodigal son is the artist figure. 
So this is one of those comical self-portraits with Saskia, but he could also, as I said, paint her very seriously, very nicely, with a lot of respect. Here is Saskia once more with the flower, with a little carnation flower. Carnation flower is something associated with marriage. And there is another woman with a pink, as they call it, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art by Rembrandt, a late painting of a woman with a carnation, also suggesting marriage or fidelity. Once more, this is not your Dutch dress. She's vaguely historiated. She lo he loves painting his wife as a history figure, as somebody who is above the ordinary, at the same time keeping her recognizably as Saskia. Does she look like the golden girl? from the night watch, except the golden girl looks like a child, but the features are those of Saskia. And this is 1641, a year before her death. Well, in this particular case, take a look. Again, a historiated portrait of Saskia. Look at the date here. We don't know. They say circa 1634 to 1642. Why are people so uncertain about dating? Because this guy doesn't make it easy on us. He can make a smooth painting early on, a smooth painting in the 40s, a rough painting early on, a rough painting in the 40s. Pigments don't age that much that you can differentiate within decades. But also because he tends towards pentimenti. He changes his composition, adds things, and modifies. Like he keeps the pictures for two years at home. Then he says, hmm, I'm going to put another chain. So x-rays show you that there is one image underneath. Then he changes his mind a couple of years later and adds something and obliterates another detail. And that's another reason why it's so difficult to date his work. And this is, by the way, probably the most idealized image of Saskia. This is where, you know, that kind of softness of her, of her face, the roundness of the, of the face is not as emphasized, where she's very smooth and I would say more beautiful than she probably was. She's also painted in profile. My speculation, personal as an art historian, is that this is painted simply in 1642 upon her death and that this may not be even painted by looking at her directly. Why am I saying that? Because a portrait in profile was considered ever since antiquity as a commemorative portrait. You remember people through all those medals, you right? It commemorates, it keeps that face, preserves it forever. Portrait in profile is also seen as being more faithful or more eternal because the profile doesn't change as much as we age. You remember people through profiles according to this tradition artistically. All of those other portraits we saw, Saskia gestures, Saskia is in the moment. She exists at a given moment of time. Here, it feels far more formal and permanent and distant, as if she were no longer there. But once more, I couldn't prove this. I'm just giving it to you as a suggestion. And this is what art historians say, that he added the ostrich feather and put the sprig of rosemary for remembrance. But I would say he probably painted the whole thing around 1642 because we really cannot date it pre precisely, so there is no reason to call this 1634 to 1642. I think this is a commemorative portrait of his Saskia as the queen, so to speak, who is no longer with him, done from memory rather than from looking. Look at that. He really, really went all out when he made this portrait. This was a special thing, an icon he created to keep. The most idealized, the most finely rendered portrait. 
And this one is quite interesting in that sense because it's at the National Gallery of Art. Next to the one from Castle, I feel that this is also a portrait where he may be dealing with her loss because what you have here is National Gallery dates this to probably begun 1634-35, completed 1638-1642. What does that tell you? Nothing. We just roughly put it in that decade while Saskia is alive. Essentially, this is very funny dating because it goes from the beginning of their marriage to the end. But in my mind, because uh, X-rays tell us that he modified and changed it, that he added the veil later on and changed a couple of other details in the attire. In my mind, I think that this was begun while she was alive and then made a little bit more somber and veiled and darkened after her passing away. So I'm trying to convey to you this private Rembrandt and today and the way in which he looks at the women of his life, specifically Saskia in this case, as uh, in creating their portraits, this is not just about selling pictures to Amsterdam burgers. It's very much a private enterprise. There is the close up. I look at her and I think of the girl in gold. I don't know why, but I do. Maybe I've seen them too many times. So, not only did he paint Saskia, but his students were encouraged to paint portraits of Saskia. In an interesting way, this not too beautiful woman becomes the muse of Rembrandt's studio. So Howard Flink, who works with him at this moment, paints Saskia and she becomes sellable as a brand from his studio. So they generate these portraits of Saskia for the market. This is not an especially great one. And talking about fakes and signatures and whatnot, check this out. It has both name and date, fake. So even though it has signature and date, people say this is Howard Flink, not Rembrandt, his student. In other words, these things could be added subsequently or the guy was not terribly scrupulous at times. People have argued that sometimes Rembrandt, who always had lots of studio assistants when he was successful, allowed his studio people to paint something and he would just do finishing touches and put the signature to sell it for more money. So that complicates the issue further in the authorship uh, question. And here is another beautiful portrait by somebody, Rembrandt's studio, of Saskia from 1643. So this is after her death, according to these art historians from Berlin. What does that tell you? That Saskia continues to represent a kind of a muse for historiated portraits of women in the studio. I would say this is one of the finest images we've seen of her as a woman. But we have no idea who painted it. Why do people think it's not Rembrandt? Probably because they think it's not as well painted, which I disagree with. But what I see as non-Rembrandt is the face. You remember I mentioned, if you see a face that feels too pretty somehow, and also uh, it doesn't have a sense of three-dimensionality. There is, there is a kind of flatness, even though it's well painted. There is a kind of flatness, excessive smoothness in this face. And this is what makes it non-Rembrandt. Now, for the remainder of the time, just for the next 10 minutes, I want to turn to another woman in his life. And this is Henrique Stoffels, who was younger than him, about 20 years younger, as you can tell. And she came to the house after the death of Saskia. Not immediately, another woman came to take care of the children and then after a while Hendrike came as a maid and then he got rid of the first maid because apparently he had a relationship with her. He got rid of her so he could pick up with Hendrike. That's how the story goes. And Hendrike stayed in the house until her death in 1663. 
He dies in 1669, which means the second wife de facto dies before him as well. But she was never a wife proper because he could not marry her. And the relationship with Hendrike was one of the reasons why he fell out of favor because they had children out of wedlock, but they couldn't legally marry it because of the prohibition related to the first marriage and the money. And therefore, they called her this harlot living with this painter in Amsterdam, what a disgrace to the community, etc., etc. So she was a lower born woman, but look how he painted her like a queen. Hendrike would also be a muse for many years, and Hendrike would be treated in a variety of ways, sometimes in very, very humble manner, where the softness of her skin, her aging, everything. She's only in her 30s here, by the way, if she were barely 30. Sometimes more idealized, like Hendrike waiting for him in bed with a beautiful nightcap with gold. Sometimes Hendrike would be painted like Flora. These people say this is Hendrike S. Flora from the 1650s. So he kind of associates this notion of the young woman and fertility, just like with Saskia, with the new wife, Hendrike. There is the Flora from the Met. Fantastic picture when you go and see it in reality. And more, more close to, to here is a close up. Beautiful, soft, competent, sensitively rendered. Look at the flowers, look at that skin. Again, the pearls, the dress she wears, even though she's not excessively prettified once more. But she's of a similar facial type as Saskia. But I wanted to show you, as a contrast, what goes on in Amsterdam in terms of portraiture at the time. The same Howard Flink, whom you saw early on as the painter of the Saskia portrait from the studio, became one of the most popular portrait painters in Amsterdam in the 1650s. And this is the kind of work that people loved. Lots of blue, lots of gold, lots of expensive pigments, milky skin, super polished painting where you can't see the brush stroke. And this is the guy who basically takes all of the portrait commissions in the 50s and Rembrandt de facto begins to lose most of his patronage. So in the 50s, they call this sometimes French fashion. All of a sudden, there is this very Frenchy imported new style in Dutch art. Dutch art becomes more formal, more regal all around, second generation of very wealthy people. And this is what they like. They don't like all that brown mud from Rembrandt. <laughs> no, they said he paints like mud, some of those critics. Art theory of the time was all a 